Lectures by Neville Goddard Consummation, The Pattern Man No one knows how many civilizations must rise and fall before the end of the historic process on earth. But I can assure you that when it does come to its end, the consummation will be Jesus Christ, the pattern man. But no one knows how many convulsions will take place in this world before that end, but it will all be consummated in Jesus Christ, the pattern man. Now tonight I want to share with you what I have experienced. I want to share with you what I have been sent to tell you and tell you I must and will. When we are taught in scripture that he who now is called Jesus Christ is here only for one purpose, and that is to fulfill scripture. Not to change government, not to get involved, he leaves everything as he finds it. He's only telling of a pattern, a pattern that must be fulfilled in the individual to bring this historic process to an end within him. The scripture must be fulfilled in me. Now the only scripture spoken of is the Old Testament. The new was not written. So he's only speaking of the old. Now we go back to the old. And here we read all the people of Israel came to David. And they say to him, We are your bones and your flesh. And the Lord said to you, You will be. Bear the tent. You will be the shepherd over my people Israel. I have made a covenant with you that is everlasting, but you will be the shepherd over my people Israel, and you will be their prince forever. You will read that in the second Samuel, fifth chapter. It's also repeated in the book of Kings and also Chronicles, but the second chapter, the fifth, the second book of Samuel, the fifth chapter will give it to you. Now comes the thought of David as he's leaving the world. And these are the last words of David. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks by me, and his word is upon my tongue. Now here is David speaks, his word is upon my tongue, he speaks by me. Now we turn to the New Testament, which is the interpretation of the Old. He is not called David. He is called, in the New Testament, the Christ. And in the New Testament, in the 14th chapter of John, he makes the statement, the words that you hear are not mine, but the Father who sent me. The Father is the Spirit. The 
identical thought is conveyed in that statement. Prior to this claim that he makes, he said, the day is coming. It hasn't yet come. The day is coming when you will know that I am in the Father and the Father in me and that I am in you. That day is coming. Then he goes on to say, I will manifest myself to you. Then Judas, not Iscariot, but a Judas, he doesn't say who Judas is, and he said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And he replied, he who keeps my commandment, my father loves, and I love, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who has my commandments and keeps them, well, what are his commandments? Remember, he cannot say anything that is not in the Old Testament. He's only come to fulfill God's word, which is in the Old Testament. He reduces 613 commandments to two. For the rabbis have taken the Old Testament and they have discovered 613 commandments. 365 are negative, 248 are positive, 613. He reduces them to two, which you will find in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and you'll find in Leviticus, the 19th chapter. And this is what he said to the one who said to him concerning the commandments. They asked him, what is the greatest commandment? He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That's the greatest. And one that is equal to it is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the Christian believes that's an original one in the New Testament. It's taken from Leviticus, the 19th chapter, the 18th verse. For he's only going to fulfill scripture. So he takes 613 commandments and reduces them to two. If you hear these two and abide by them, I will manifest myself to you. And my father and I will love you. And we will come and make our home with you. But what is the first one? There is only one causation. I kill. I make alive. I wound. I heal. I create the light. I form the darkness. I make the wheel. I form the world. And there is no other God besides. Never forget it. There's only one creative power. And I'll tell you who he is. Your own wonderful human imagination. God became as we are. That we may be as he is. He allows us all the liberty in the world to create real or woe, darkness or light, to murder or to give life. It's the same power. There aren't two creative powers in the world. That's the first commandment. And the second is equal to the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because your neighbor is yourself 
pushed out. There is nothing in this world but God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. And everything in this world is God pushed out, bearing witness to an activity that is taking place within us, of which we may be totally unaware. But it bears witness to what is taking place within us. So said he, I will come and manifest myself to those who abide by my commandments, and he reduces the commandments to two. Do you really believe in that first confession of faith? It's called the Shema. Israel's confession of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. There is no room for a devil. There is no room for a Satan. There is no room for any power in this world outside of God. All these are negations for the 365 commandments that are negative. 248 positive. All reduced to two. And the two are so simply stated to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And love your neighbor as yourself, regardless of the pigment of his skin, regardless of his tongue, regardless of his background, he is yourself pushed out. <clears throat> so whatever you are doing to him, you're only doing to self. The whole vast world is the individual, <coughs> pardon me, pushed out to bear witness to the activity taking place within him. Now listen to these words carefully. This is now from Peter's first epistle, his fifth chapter. And when the chief shepherd is manifested. The chief shepherd is manifested. You will obtain the unfading glory of the crown. You will actually obtain this unfading crown. And it's the crown of glory, and in scripture, glory is identified with God. You become God when the chief shepherd is manifested. In the Old Testament, the only shepherd spoken of is David. That is David. When he makes himself manifest to you, he reveals you as God the Father. For God became you, that you may become God. But you will not know, not in eternity, that you are God, until that chief shepherd is manifested to you, who reveals you as his Father. And his Father is God, and he is the Son. So I am telling you what I know from experience. It is not written in any book that I have ever read. It is not recorded in any place where I have ever encountered it. I have never heard it from another man. But I have been sent to tell you what I have experienced. When the risen Lord embraced me and sent me, and the words were down with the blue blood, meaning protocol, church protocol, all these extraneous things that keeps from man the truth that God will be revealed to man. All ceremonies, all rituals, all these things that hide the truth from man. And then it was revealed within me through actual experience. And I cannot restrain my words. 
I must tell it to you. Should I go tonight, at least you have a record right now. Your knees here are moving. And you have a record of what I actually have experienced. He can only fulfill scripture. And scripture is the Old Testament. So every word spoken of him that is real, go back. So I think something new came when he said, I give you a commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go back into the 19th chapter of the book of Leviticus, the 18th verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the command. Go back to the 6th chapter of Deuteronomy. Name the greatest of all the commandments. And he named that sixth chapter, the fourth and fifth verses. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. By him all things are made. And without him was not anything made that was made. There is nothing but the one creator, good, bad, or indifferent. So here he sends himself into the world, awakening man. I cannot tell you how many civilizations must rise and fall. We think that we are permanent forever. England thought that. Russia thinks that. Greece thought it. Rome thought it. Egypt thought it. The ancient world thought it. And they have come and gone. And they will rise and fall. But in the end, the consummation of it all will be Jesus Christ. Jesus being your own wonderful I am. That's the Lord. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, which is remembrance. And you can't remember that you are until the Son reveals you as the being that you really are. So Christ must come, and Christ is the anointed one. So rise and anoint him. Anoint whom? David. This is my chosen one. So rise and anoint him. I have chosen him. So Christ is the Son, and Jesus is the Lord I am. So they will come and make their home with you. If you have heard and accept the two commandments. Those who have heard my commandments and abide by them. Then I will manifest myself to you. This is now the Son speaking. So he speaks, although under the name of Scripture, as Jesus Christ. Learn to discriminate if the Son is speaking or the Father is speaking. In that capacity when he said, my Father, then he's speaking as Son. And so the Son is saying, I will manifest myself to you. When the Son manifests himself to you, he reveals you as his Father. For no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, he will choose to reveal himself to you, when you accept and abide by the commandments, and there are only two, <clears throat> that there's only one creative power in the world, your own wonderful human imagination, and that is God, there is no other God. And the next commandment is, love your neighbor as yourself. If any friend of mine tonight was accused of any crime in this world, and they asked me, what should I do? What is your opinion? I would say, forgive him. If my daughter, my wife, the dearest of my heart, had committed the most horrible crime in the world, and I was called as a witness, and the judge asked of me, what would you do? What would I do? I forgive her. I wouldn't care what anyone I love did. I want them forgiven. 
That's what he's saying. Love your neighbor as yourself. Am I going to stand in judgment and pass judgment? She is deserving of death. She's deserving of this, that, and the other. No. Not as I understand scripture. Not as I understand the unity of being. I want to forgive every aspect of my own being. For in my own being, I caused it. I could not become aware of it were it not within me that it happened. It happened in me. Now I witness it and it bears witness to what I did within myself. The whole vast world is myself pushed out. When I told this story years ago concerning my first wife, I was violently criticized. I only told it to explain a certain principle. But they didn't understand what I'm trying to say. And she criticized me, well, verbally in the most marvelous way, as she could conceive it. But it's perfectly all right. That was her right. She's myself pushed out anyway. <clears throat> but here was one that I pleaded with the judge to forgive her. A simple little thing that she did. But it meant six months in jail. And I pleaded with that judge to please forgive her. You do not know the emotional strain under which she's been going. And she is eight years my senior. And therefore she must now be 45 or 46 and going through the normal change of life that happens to women. Maybe it happens to men too. But it's an obvious happening in women. <clears throat> Take that into consideration and forgive her. If you must sentence her, do it. But then suspend it. He abided by my request. And she met me on the outside. And said, it's a very decent thing of you to do now. Well, give me the papers for my divorce. Well, I didn't have. I didn't have any papers with me. So I took her home to my place. And I gave her the papers. A thing I'm told legally I'm not supposed to do. But I nevertheless, I gave them to her, and I got my divorce in New York City. She only responded to my dear and deep need. I wanted a divorce. So she was forced to do what she did, based upon what I was doing within myself. I was sleeping in the assumption that I was blissfully happy. I'm married to the girl to whom I'm now married. And it's a heaven in this world with me. No matter what at the moment is happening to her, it still is a blissful state with me. Blessed with the most glorious daughter. And she did what she had to do. That I may get my freedom. For in those days, the archaic law rested over New York City. And you couldn't get a divorce by saying, we are incompatible. You had to bring all kinds of the stupid lies to the world to do it. So we didn't have to bring any. I simply got my divorce. So I'm saying that the whole vast world is bearing witness to what you are doing within yourself, in your own wonderful human imagination, for that's God. There is no other God. God became as I am, that's his name, that I may be as he is, and he is God the Father. He is God the Creator. There is nothing but God. So I tell you, this story is the truest story in the world. And how many countries must rise and fall, civilizations must come and go, I do not know. But I do know that whenever it is consummated, it's going to be consummated in Jesus Christ, the pattern man. That pattern must unfold itself in every child born of woman. And it will. It cannot fail. As it unfolds, the day will come that you will accept these two commandments. That there's only one causation in the world. He didn't cause it. She didn't cause it. They didn't cause it. I am causing it. That's the only cause in the world. 
Are you big enough to accept that responsibility? That no one in the world has caused anything that ever hurt you or praised you. You're doing it all within yourself and they only bear witness of what you are doing and have done. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, now because of that, love your neighbors as yourself. For they only aid what you are doing within you. And if one has to go to jail to fulfill what you've done within you, love him. He is paying a price that you yourself have placed upon him. The whole vast world is the individual pushed out. It's an egocentric world. For there's only God. And God is one. So this is the story that I want to share with you. So I've come into the world, said you, to bear witness to the truth. And the truth is your word. And your word can only be found in the day when these words were written in the Old Testament. And thy word cannot be broken. Now he goes and he finds out who is the chosen one to express the will of the Father. And he finds it as David. And the whole of Israel came to David. And they said to David, We are your bones and your flesh. And the Lord said to you, You will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And you will be the prince of Israel. That future, and even in the New Testament, it is still future, because it's going to happen to the individual. It's not something that happened once and forever. It is taking place in the world. So when you go home, read that second Samuel, the fifth chapter. Then read the 23rd chapter of second Samuel. And then find who that real shepherd is. Read Peter's first letter, the fifth chapter. You'll find it in the fourth verse. Don't have to go too far. The fifth chapter, the fourth verse, and he tells you when the chief shepherd comes. And when the chief shepherd is manifested, you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. That is God himself. The minute he is manifested, you see him, the chief shepherd, and he is David. And David reveals you as his father, and the father of David is God. That's the story. So I tell everyone here, yes, you can have all the things in this world that you want, but everything, I don't care what it is. In the world of Caesar, it's simple. It's very easy. But let me share with you a little thing that happened to me today. That I may remove from you a certain fear. A friend of mine came back just before I took the platform and allowed me to read a certain little letter which I will not quote. But it's for his benefit too to show you how in the world of Caesar they try to scare you to death. I brought my wife home today from St. Vincent Hospital. So I went downstairs to the cashier to pay my bill. And she said to me, as she looked at it, she said, I think that you will owe $30. And then I said, I didn't say anything. She said, oh no, your deposit when you came in exceeds the $30 because my wife is now 65, so she's on Medicare. And we also have Blue Cross. So Blue Cross and Medicare is supposed to pick up something like 80% of expenses. So she said, no, you do not owe us anything. In fact, we owe you. I didn't ask her for any refund because we'll be going back for another six visits. I came home to find in my letterbox a bill from St. Vincent posted only yesterday. Today they tell me that they, I owe nothing 
that they, in fact, owe me. And as I open the letter, that is, this little bill, that I owe them $5,403.63. Would that amuse me? The 63 cents. So I got on the telephone right away, and I called the credit department, and I asked to please give me the paid man, whoever he is. I identified myself as I've just brought my wife home. And you told me only two hours ago that I owe you nothing. In fact, you owe me something, which I did not collect. And now you tell me that I owe you $5,403.63. Oh, for a second. Then they go back and, uh, will you hold the wire? I said, I will, willingly. So they came back and they said, that was the computer's mistake. <laughs> so the computer went to town, all kinds of things over the years, the year and a half that I've been there, Undoubtedly, I have paid them that much. And so, they're billing it to me again. Because I've already paid out to the two hospitals over $14,000 before she became Medicare. Now that she's on Medicare, and this is billed in the month of March, when she's already on Medicare in the month of February. So I said, you know, my wife has Blue Cross plus Medicare, and I can't conceive that 10 days only 10 days in the hospital that I could owe you $5,403.63. So she confessed. Then she said to me, don't worry, Mr. Goddard. I said, may I tell you something? I do not worry. <laughs> I won't tear it up. I'm going to frame it just as a little lie. I'm not going to uh, tear it up. I'll take this little deal and frame it just for fun. So may I say to my friend who came back tonight, don't let anyone tell you for one moment he can cut your ears off. Or in any way, incarcerate you. Forget it. You have caused everything that has happened to you. That little silly thing that came amused me. So that was my little amusement for the day. I brought her home. And she came home and she's lovely, altogether sweet. Didn't lose any weight, and she's strong. She has to go back to the normal. Uh, things that must be done to her. But that came as an amusement, but because we both got a good hearty laugh out of it. And so I will say to my friend, go down on the day that you're told to come down, but go with a laugh in your heart. They can't do a thing to you. Because you caused it all, and you can change it all. There's only one God in the world, only one creative power in the world, and that power is your own wonderful human imagination. Let them go all over the world looking for another cause, and they aren't going to find it. You'll only find one cause, and that cause is resident in everyone in the world. His own imagination is entirely up to us. If tonight you are fired, may I tell you, it could be a blessing because you dreamt bigger dreams than the present job could ever give you. So if you are fired, in my own case, when I was fired from J.C. Penney, $22 a week I was making. And they're fired. I ask, why? What have I done that is wrong? But nothing. But we have a certain system here, and when things decline in business, we let people out. And so, after a year and a half of service, you have to go. I said, what will I use for money to pay for my rent? I was paying $5 a week for my room. That's not our concern. Well, he realized I was completely green, so he gave me a little letter to Macy's, a friend of his who employed people. So Macy's employed me at $4 less. They gave me $18 a week. So then I determined I will not work for anyone but Neville in this world. I'm going to work here just long enough at the quit. So I worked there for a year, and one day I said, you aren't going to fire me. I'm quitting. Worked there a year. I'm still making $18 a week. So then I quit. And many a day I starved. 
Many of the I went hungry. I didn't have the money. Didn't have any food. But I wasn't going to work for anyone else in this world. I worked only for Neville. And then came my visions. And from then on, the father gave me an outside source of income. And that was my story. So I tell it and share it with you. You don't have to be afraid of anyone in this world if you know this principle. And take everyone in this world as yourself pushed out. So when I was fired from J.C. Penny, they were my friend, but I didn't know it. Everyone who tried to put me down, they were my friend. When I went to a little school and they said, you'll never make a living using your voice. I resented that, but she was my friend because she fired me. She fired me to disprove her. If she hadn't said that, I would have gone blindly on and not have done it. But she struck something in me that simply rose the fire in me. So if someone can strike you to rise the fire in you, it's yourself because of your own activity. Within your own mind, you are dreaming noble dreams far greater than your present job allows. And the more you're fired. All right. It's a turning point in your good fortune, I tell you. I know that from my own family's history. When we were completely down to the ground, with no food and nothing, it was a turning point in our family's fortunes. So from nothing, with all these children, the family rose, and today, well, you couldn't buy them out. If anybody wants to come today and buy them out, don't come under $50 million because you couldn't even interest them under $50 million. And we were fired out in 1922 with nothing. 22, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. And from nothing, and you couldn't interest us unless you brought $50 million if you want to buy us out. And that's because they did not accept it as final. It was a challenge. If you're going to take a blow and go down with it, all well and good. Not knowing the whole vast world is yourself pushed out. But I am telling you, the whole vast world is yourself pushed out. And everyone is only bearing witness to the man or the woman that you are. And you are your own wonderful human imagination and morning, noon, and night, your active imagining. And the whole thing is taking place in your outer world. And they are telling you who you are. So read it carefully. I have quoted tonight from just a few passages. 14th chapter of John. It's a glorious book, John. But I took the 14th chapter. And then I took the fifth chapter of Second Samuel. I took the twenty-third chapter of Second Samuel. Then I took the fifth chapter of the first letter of Peter. These are all that I have taken to weave together this thought that David is the Son of God. And by David I mean he is the resultant state God is the only reality. But in the end, he is going to manifest himself because he dwells in you. And may I tell you what's going to happen? There's going to be an explosion within your brain, as it were. You'll feel the whole head explode. And when the explosion is over, and it all settles, he who was within you, listen to the word, the day will come that you will know that I... I mean my father. And when the father explodes, he releases his son. He promised he would. And the son comes up and calls him father. And the father knows exactly who he is. But he also tells you, and you are in me. So the whole vast world is himself pushed out, but the son is in the father. And the son is David. He is the great shepherd. 
So when the chief shepherd is manifested, then you will obtain the unfading run of glory. Now let us go into the silence. Good. Now, are there any questions, please? I think you know that I am not closing tonight. I have asked for an extension of the month of May based upon the needs of my wife. So I will be here every Monday and Friday through the month of May. Same place, same time. Now, are there any questions? We are on all levels of sound asleep on this one. We are we are sound asleep on all. We are weak. This is the most important level. This is the limit of contraction, the limit of opacity. And you break it from here. This is so important to become flesh and blood here. So when they give me all these stories of abortions and these things, I don't go for it. It's not really a problem of uh, people. It's an economic problem. And I'm not an economist. We can produce so much food and so much wear and so much material for building homes and so much of everything that it would frighten the mind but how to distribute it under the present economic system. So it is not a matter of exposing the population. It's simply an economic problem and I am not an economist. I do not know under what system such distribution of our ability could be distributed. But I am told why, well, he was a grand, grand gentleman. I heard him speak in New York City. And that was George Washington Carver, who gave us the peanut butter. And he gave us something like 600 byproducts of the southern pine and the southern peanut. Because they were going to see, not knowing what to do with it, the grumble. And he asked God, why did you make a peanut? And he said, God said to him, go into your laboratory and I will show you why I made a peanut. And so he went into his laboratory and meditated and then experimented and God showed him why he made a peanut. In one little peanut, he brought out something like 300 byproducts. So we have the peanut butter, the peanut oil, all kinds of things. And he stood before this wonderful group of men at the Waldorf Astoria, just about the year before he died. And he said, the very tie that I wear came out of the southern pine. Everything I'm wearing now and the pigments on my tie, all this came out of the southern pine. Hundreds of byproducts. And then he said, we, do, we could from the southern state, he meant the Mason-Dixon line. That's what he meant by southern state. Said we from the southern state could feed and clothe and house the entire world, not America, 
but the whole vast world from the byproduct. Therefore, it is an economic problem. It is not a matter of children coming into this world. So I, I have no answer to that. I can only tell you that I heard that great gentleman say that. I heard him on radio. I was not physically present at the banquet. You had to be invited. And only those who were prominent were invited. So I knew it was on, and it would be on radio, so I tuned him in for the entire banquet and heard it at the Waldorf Astoria. In those days, we had no TV. It was simply radio. And I heard that grand, wonderful man say what I've just said.